Um, special greeting to those of you who are watching on the internet around the world, uh, those of you who are watching via video feed at uh, any of our missions. May God's richest blessings be upon you, and those of you in the overflow of room, may God's blessings be upon you as well. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts today, and so I'd like to ask you in just a second to open to Acts chapter 16. But before we do that, hold your Bibles up in the air, please. Hold your Bibles up in the air. Let's say the prayer we always pray as we study the book of Acts. Dear Lord, thank you for your wonderful acts. What you did then, would you do again? What you did through them, would you do through us? In Jesus' name, amen. Now open your Bibles. <clears throat> to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And the verses that I read that are not in Acts chapter 16 will appear on the screen, and those that are in Acts chapter 16 won't because they are there in your Bible. I came home not too long ago to a house full of blocked doors. Uh, not just locked doors, and not just closed doors, and not just shut doors, but a house of blocked doors doors. And you can blame it on Molly. <laughs> Molly is our dear family member, nine years old, 90 pounds. And she's a great dog. Not only does she go get my paper, she reads it. She puts her glasses on and, and she reads uh, the paper every day. Uh, Molly is really a good dog when it comes to kids and company, but boy, when it comes to doors, she just doesn't get it. I've heard other people talk about when their dog wants to go out, uh, the dog barks, or one man told me just after the second service that his dog hits a little bell, smart aleck, and uh, our dog scratches the door. I mean, scratches the door. Molly is the canine version of Freddy Krueger. <laughs> Consequently, we have Molly marks on all of our doors. So Deanland came up with a great solution. Doggy doors. You know what doggy doors are. Molly-sized doors through which she can enter or exit at any time of the day. So she installed these, had these installed on two of the doors. And to teach Molly to use the Molly door or the doggy doors, you know what she did? I came home one day and every door in our house was blocked with furniture. I mean, stacks of furniture she had placed in front of the door. She put the piano in front of the door. She put her car in front of the door. There was no way Molly was getting out the doors that did not have a doggy door. Molly still didn't get it. Because when I came home, Molly was just sitting, looking at the stack of stuff. Her tail was limp. Her ears were hanging. Her eyes were sad. And she had that expression like, I can't get through the door. She was just staring at the blocked door. And she was very frustrated. Maybe you are too. Do you know the frustration of a blocked door? You don't think anyone's reading your resume? No one's returning your call. Universities aren't accepting your application. The doctors don't have any solutions. The market is slow. No one's looking at your house that's for sale or you can't find a house you can afford that's for sale. Do you know the frustration of a, of a blocked door? If you do, the Apostle Paul is your friend. He was on his second missionary journey, this time traveling with Silas and Timothy, when they just seemed to hit one blocked door after another. 
The first journey had gone really well. Maybe that's what surprised them about the blocked doors on the second journey. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 27, they gave a report to the church that sent them, the church in Antioch. They began to report all the things that God had done with them. How he had, look at this, opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. One door after another. A door in Cyprus, a door in Antioch, a door in Iconium. Even the door in Jerusalem with the Jerusalem council that we considered last week. He opened the door of grace. And then in Acts 16 and verse 5, if you'll read in your Bible, the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. So it's like the missionaries had, their wind, had the wind at their backs. Every door opened that they tried to enter. But then verses 6 and 7, the doors begin to shut. Now when they had gone through Phrygia in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come down to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. You see, Paul set his sights on Asia, but no doors open. So he turned north to go to Bithynia, but that didn't work either. Everywhere they went, they jiggled the knobs and they, they pressed against the entrances, but they just couldn't gain access. We are not told on practical terms how this happened, how God forbade them just don't know nor do we really know why we just know that the holy spirit closed every door and he still does he's still prone to close doors god owns the key to every door he is the holy the true david's key is in his hand opening doors no one can lock and locking doors no one can open you see, Jesus administrates all passageways, doesn't he? He oversees all entrances and exits. He's the ultimate air traffic controller. And apart from his permission, you cannot land or you cannot leave. And once he shuts a door, no one can open it. Once he shut the door of Noah's ark, no one could open it. And once he shut the door on Jesus' tomb, no one can open it until he opened it. He is to humanity what Dean was and is to Molly. He controls all entrances and all exits. And sometimes he closes doors because he has a better door in mind. But in the time that we're waiting to figure it out, we, like Molly, can grow a bit frustrated. I certainly did. A few years ago, I was really under conviction that it was time for the Crown Ridge campus of the Oak Hills Church to build a new sanctuary. We were bursting at the seams. We still are. And I thought, surely God wants us to have room for people to meet. We were in many services, and so we designed this 4,000-seat sanctuary, presented it to uh, to the leadership of the church and the church felt good about it we prayed about it as a church we all felt good about it we felt the wind at our backs so to speak and so we kicked off the fundraising campaign 20 million dollars it's a lot of money within a few weeks less than two months the price had gone from 20 million dollars to 34 million I've been told that the Olympic construction in China was to blame for the cost of everything. I don't know, but I know the price went up very fast. So we came back to the church and said, if we're going to do this, we have to ante up even more. And so we did. But even then, even though the offering was astoundingly generous, it was not enough for us to build the sanctuary without going into what we considered dangerous debt. I can remember very specifically and clearly the emotions that I felt as I had to tell you, the church, we're not going to build the sanctuary. I just don't like saying we're not going to do something. But we, we just didn't have the open door. And I remember wondering why. Why, why did he close that door? We prayed about it. 
We were responsible about it. We asked for God's blessings to be upon it. So we took all the money that we raised. We paid everything off. And still I wondered, why didn't he let us build that sanctuary? Looking back, we're beginning to get an idea, aren't we? Because you see, before we built this, before the plans for the sanctuary, we did not know that we were only months away from one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression. And we did not know that I was only months away from being diagnosed with a severe heart condition. God has healed the heart condition, and he's leading us through the recession. And now we look back and say, oh, I think God had a better door for us. And that is to bring someone in like Randy Frazee to kind of readjust our strategy. And instead of bringing everybody to one campus, begin to push the church out into all of South Texas And now we're beginning to see this. But in the midst of it, it's sometimes very difficult. But we're learning that when God closes a door, it's not because he doesn't love us, just the opposite. Sometimes because he does love us, he closes a door. And that's exactly what happened with Paul and his team. God blocked them from going north, so they tried to go south. God blocked them from going south. And so they could either go east and give up, go back to Antioch, or they could go west, which would take them to Europe. They wanted to go to Asia. But apparently in God's plan, it was time to cross the Aegean Sea and go to Greece. Verse 9 of Acts 16. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. God was ready for the gospel to go into Europe. And so, in verse uh, 11, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course, circle the word we, that means that Luke has joined up with them now. We ran a straight course to Samothrace, And the next day came to Neapolis and from there to Philippi. Now, you know that the Bible was written, New Testament was written in Greek. And sometimes we find these little nuggets in the Greek language. This phrase, they ran a straight course, literally means they felt the wind at their back. They felt the wind at their back. You know, sometimes we knock on a door, knock on a door, and everything's it's just nothing but resistance. And then we take a step, and boy, there's wind at our back. And we know we're in the center of the Lord's will. So they went to Greece, what we call Greece, Macedonia then, and they went to a town called Philippi. And they went outside the town of Philippi to a river where there was a gathering of Jews for a prayer service. And there they came across a little nervous because their business is in danger. And they conjure up false accusations against Paul and Silas. Picking up in verse 22 of Acts 16. The multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. There's that sound again. Closing doors. Bam. 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 This time it's prison doors, jail doors, and the turning of the key in the lock. Paul and Silas, in the heart of the prison, could have looked at each other and said, Oh, no. God closed the doors on us. But they didn't. From the heart of the prison comes the most unlikely of sounds. Does anyone know what it was? Singing. Singing. And prayer. Though their feet were in stalks, their minds were in heaven. And they were singing. And they were praying. How could they sing in the middle of the night, in the middle of the prison? Only one way, and that is they firmly believed that whatever God does is right. They believed the words of Hosea 14 and verse 9. The ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them. 
Luke 18 and verse 6, Jesus said, God will always give what is right to his people and cry, who cry to him night and day. He will not be slow to answer them. You see, when God locks a door, it needs to be locked. When God shuts a door, it needs to be shut. Have you been around the block enough times to look back over your life and say, God, thank you that you did not hear my prayer. Thank you that she did not accept my marriage invitation. Thank you that I did not receive that transfer. Have you learned the wisdom of the great theologian Garth Brooks? Who's saying, we thank God for unanswered prayer. Sometimes when God closes a door, it's because that door just needs to be closed. And sometimes God closes the door of the jail because he has his eye on the jailer. That's what happened here. Verse 26 says, All the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. As they sang, the earth shook and the doors opened. And when the jailer saw the doors were open, he assumed everyone had escaped. So he took his sword out and he was going to commit suicide because he knew he would be killed for all the escape of the prisoners. But Paul and Silas shout out and say, it's okay, we're here. And in the next conversation, the jailer hears about Christ. And next thing we know, the jailer has Paul and Silas in his house. He's treating their wounds. He washes their wounds. Jesus washes his sins. He's baptized. What do you know? God's opening, closing doors just so he can reach another person. This is what our Father does. His priority is not your comfort nor mine. His priority is people. His priority is the salvation of souls. And he will close a door to leave you in a room so you can converse with somebody. He will open a door and transfer you across the country so that you'll have an opportunity to bear witness to his goodness. His goal is not your comfort nor mine. His goal is people. I wonder if we might have seen an example of this in the, of all places, the 2010 National Championship football game in the Rose Bowl. Colt McCoy, the quarterback for the University of Texas, has enjoyed four years of open doors. And in the game of his collegiate career, the National Championship game, the door slammed shut. Early in the first quarter, he sustained a shoulder injury that put him out for the rest of the game. He spent a good portion of the game in the locker room. I don't know if he, like Paul and Silas, was singing in the locker room. But I do know he was trusting. And we know this from what he said after the game. Turn your attention to the screen. How do you do that? How, how do you get to the point in your life where you can see a major disappointment as God's appointment? How do you get to the point where you can see what appears to be a closed door is really God's open door? Well, I asked Colt that question. Max. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of your lesson today. Uh, obviously, during the game, uh, with the shoulder injury, it was a huge disappointment. Uh, something that I had worked for my entire life, my whole career, uh, was to be able to play in the national championship game and uh, you know, lead my team to a victory. Uh, that, that was something that, that I had, had dreamed about my whole life. And uh, when that was taken away, uh, there, there was a huge disappointment. Um, you know, when I got back in the locker room, uh, you know, they had tested, they did x-rays, they did all the, uh, you know, the checkups. Uh, it, it just, there was, it, there was no way I could come back into the game. And uh, I was really frustrated, really mad. I was just mad. And, uh, you know, came back onto the field and, and tried to do my best uh, as a leader from the sidelines. You know, I've, I've always been on the field. My team, I've always had my teammates out on the field with me. And it was just tough uh, to stand there and, and you know, watch our team get beat and uh, you know it was very disappointing and uh, after everything after the interview I, I got back into the locker room and 
uh, as I was frustrated and, and I really just sat there and thought like, man, I, you know, I hope that, that I responded to the questions well and, and answered in a way that God would be proud. And, and uh, all year long I had prayed for trust and I met with my friends and in Bible studies, uh, trust was the was the key term all year long. And, you know, Jeremiah seventeen seven says, trust in the Lord, uh, you know, and, and your confidence comes from the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 3, um, you know, it, it all has to do with trusting in the Lord. And, and uh, I think at that moment, all the things that I had been praying for all year long, uh, God allowed me to, to be able to speak up and, and say what I said. But when I got back to the locker room, uh, I was really frustrated. I started crying because I didn't know if I had responded the way that I should uh, after the game in the interview. And, and uh, I was real concerned about it. I was probably thinking about that more than, and, than my shoulder because I just knew that in that moment of disappointment, that was a chance that I could be able to, uh, you know, really stand up for what I believe in. And uh, when I got back home to the hotel and visited with my mom, uh, she, had, she had come in there crying and told me that I had said the right thing. And uh, that, it was just a huge burden lifted off my shoulder, not because of anything that I did, um, but because uh, in a time like that, I was able to really feel God and know that, hey, that was God's plan, and he has a plan for me. And uh, just because that game was taken away doesn't mean that uh, my life was taken away. You know, I have a, I have a future, and, and I know that, that God is leading that and guiding and guiding me every day. So uh, to be able to, to know that, that uh, I stand it up the way that I did uh, was was truly, um, you know, God honoring my request that I could trust in Him. And as hard as it was, I do know that God has a plan, and He has a plan for each and every one of us. And even in times of disappointment, uh, it's up to us to fully trust in God and trust in the plan that He has for us. And, uh, and one of the things that has really got me through all of this is to know that um, that might be the greatest thing that I could do on earth. I might have affected uh, more people than going into that game, winning, being the MVP, and standing up and saying, I give God the glory, which is absolutely great. Uh, but in times of disappointment, when something happens like that, uh, you know, I think it really uh, says a lot about your character and about, uh, about your true relationship with the Lord. And, you know, again, it's, it's not about me. It's not about the things that I do. I just know that God is in control, and, and He's in control of everything. He has a plan. Uh, for each and every one of us. And uh, so my encouragement would be, even in times of disappointment, uh, know that you're standing on the rock and know that God is in control. Classy guy, huh? Understand he just got engaged, which is bad news because I have two daughters that I was... <laughs> I wonder what Tim Tebow's available. <laughs> so what do you do when you're in a season of blocked doors? We all go through them. Paul's story in Acts chapter 16 gives us three practical things we can do very quickly. Number one, when you're in a season of blocked doors, get good counsel. Get good counsel. We sense the importance of counsel in verse 10. Now listen to it from a different translation. The dream gave Paul his map. We, remember Luke has joined up with him now, so there's four of them. We went to work at once, getting things ready to cross over to Macedonia. All the pieces had come together. We knew now for sure that God had called us to preach the good news to the Europeans. Look at the we. Paul gave the vision I'm sorry, God gave the vision to Paul, but then apparently Paul sought consultation among his partners. He didn't force this upon them. We now knew, Luke says. So if God gives you a vision, or if God seems to be opening a door, before you go through it, get counsel. Stay in community. Stay engaged with godly people. Does God still speak to us? through visions or dreams or supernatural voices. Listen, God is God. He owns every means of communication there is. But test your dreams. 
Test your visions. The other night I dreamed about pizza, but I'm not going to open a pizzeria. <laughs> Test your vision. Test your dreams. Test them with godly people, godly counsel, and in God's word. God will never speak through a dream something that is in conflict with his scripture. So get godly counsel. Number two, stay in the game with God. Stay in the game with God. Paul could have abandoned the work here. He could have said, well, if I can't get into Asia, I'm giving up. But he didn't. He was faithful. When we go through seasons of blocked doors, we're sitting ducks for the devil. When we go through seasons of blocked doors, we're sitting ducks for the devil. And we do stupid things. We get discouraged. And we go back to the bottle. Or we go back to the wrong person. Or we quit being around Christians. Or we quit reading scripture. We kind of pout and sulk. We, instead of doing like Colt McCoy did and trusting, we just kind of get angry. So if you're in a season of blocked doors, let me encourage you. Don't give up. Just take the next right step. Take the next right step. Do the next right thing. Keep doing the right things. And at the right time, the right door will open. Jesus said, keep on asking and you will be given what you ask for. Keep on looking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened. And then lastly, defer to God's better plan. God just has a better plan. It's not that your plan is bad. It's just that his plan is better. It's not that Asia was a bad idea. It's just that Europe was a better idea. It's not that going to jail or not going to jail is a bad idea, but going to jail and reaching the jailer was a better idea. And so God just has plans that we know nothing of. So defer to his higher plan. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, he says. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This is what I was trying to get across to Molly. <laughs> and that is, just because the door is blocked, that doesn't mean we don't like you. Quite the opposite. We've got a door tailor-made for you. Would you receive the same message? Just because your door is blocked doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Just the opposite. It's proof that he does.